when the people of God realize that what he has done is sufficient to change our capacity to shape the course of history, suddenly kings come to our light and nations to the brightness of our rising. What's happening? The Solomon effect is taking place. I don't mean that people come to you and me because we know everything. It's that people see such favor on your life. They see that there's a God element on you that has changed how you live. As we approach the subject, uh, this subject, I want to put it into a context of revelation. When the Lord gives us new revelation, and that phrase is offensive to some because they, th they think we mean in addition to Scripture. No. It's that he opens up what we've been reading all the time. I mean, you had that happen. You've read something a hundred times, you read it again, and suddenly you see it in a new light. And and, um, and that's, that's uh, what I'm referring to. Whenever the Lord gives us fresh understanding of his word, of his purposes, of what he intends to say and do, never does he reveal it so that we can abolish what he showed us previous. When the Lord gives new revelation, he always puts it in the context of the prior or previous revelation. Uh, an example of this would be uh, what I've quoted to you often when this subject comes up. And that is, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. It's as though the previous revelation becomes the setting for a diamond. The diamond would be the new revelation. So we have, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And that servanthood actually becomes the context for the ongoing learning of what intimacy and friendship with God looks like. Never was servanthood abolished. In fact, the Apostle Paul identified himself, proudly if I can say that in a righteous sense, as a servant, a bondservant of the Lord. So when we come to this subject of wisdom, there is an ongoing revelation in Scripture about this issue of wisdom. For example, in Solomon's day, when the Lord gave him this gift, this unusual gift of wisdom, the scripture says every king from every nation left their post, if you will, and traveled whatever distance it was to come to Jerusalem simply to sit at his feet and to receive from his wisdom. That tells me a number of things about the work of God. I believe very strongly in the go of the gospel. We go into all the world. In fact, we're going to be sending our students out, a couple thousand people to, I don't know how many locations around the world, uh, but there, there's going to be released because we believe in that go of the gospel. We have uh, Michael and Chandler lead our missions ministry, uh, hitting the nations day after day, year after year after year. It's something we're intensely committed to. <laughs> But there's another part of the gospel that is equally important, and that is that the Lord, in wisdom, in experience with him, friendship and intimacy with him, we learn how to do life. And in learning how to do life, we create successful communities. By successful, I, I don't mean just uh, prosperous businesses, although it includes that. It's families work well. It's the husbands and wives know how to do life. It's that children get raised into their purpose, their destiny. It's that, it's that business ideas thrive. There's not, there's not this, uh, you know, this crash and burn uh, thing that happens over and over again to people. But, but there's really a, the blessing, the favor of the Lord that rests on their life. And we just learn how to do life. It really is the meaning of the word proverb in a sense. The word proverb, of course, means riddle, uh, saying, uh, things of that nature. But it comes from a word that means to rule or to reign. And so if you think about it then, these, these wise sayings, these statements of profound revelation, they are to equip us to rule. Not rule over people, but to reign in life. Reign in life so that affliction that once used to chase you all over the planet, you now reign over that, and that thing gets broken in Jesus' name. The poverty that has reigned in your family for three or four generations gets broken because we learn how to reign in life. No longer does indebtedness, debt rule us, but we instead rule resources. And so the Lord has summoned us to experience what success looks like in following the Lord. I, I, think, I think some of us have some real changes that need to go on between the years. 
on what the Lord wants to do with us. So many people have set themselves up, um, let me put it this way, sometimes we have attributed evil things happening in our life the church has attributed so much to the dealings of the Lord that we've lost the ability to discern when we're under assault. Sometimes, I don't know if you've heard this before, but sometimes the church lives in this place where difficulties come and the church has been so accustomed to attributing difficulty to the discipline of the Lord that we've lost the ability to discern the demonic assault that takes place in our life. I could say it again, but I won't. So the Lord then is positioning us to reign in life. But anytime you and I get a victory, let's say it's in marriage, let's say that things are tough, and you learn, how to, you learn how to do life together. You learn how to thrive in your relationship with your spouse. Every breakthrough you get gives you authority to pass that on to someone else. It was never intended that you just sit in your world and enjoy breakthrough. It was always intended that whatever breakthrough you get, you give to someone else. You impart, you mentor, you pray, you do something to bring people into increased breakthrough. So here we've got this issue where the Lord is raising up a covenant community that become the city on the hill that people come to for refuge. The people come in the same way that they sought out the wisdom of Solomon. The intention of the Lord is that you and I would, ex would, would live in, in that realm, if you will, in that zone of reigning in life where things happen to us that are challenging and difficult, but because we know how to do life, we know how to resolve conflict, we know how to pay our bills, we know how to, to, to do the things that we need to do to get breakthrough. Because we learn how to reign in life and we carry that divine favor of God, what happens is you and I become positioned to attract people, in a sense, into our lives. I don't know another way to say it. I, I've, I've taught on it before in this series, so forgive me for the repeat, but I, I need the context today to wrap this series up. Because I, I think it's so vital, I think it's so important that the Lord is raising up covenant communities, families of believers that become the city set on a hill that someone who's lost can find their way and seek refuge. The intention of the Lord is to create something that people can belong to. This whole notion of personal relationship with God, while it is true, it is overemphasized dramatically in the Western world. We have a very self-centered lifestyle, very arrogant, self-centered approach to life, and we have to force ourselves to think, many, many have to force ourselves to think in terms of family or community. A statement that was made some weeks ago that I, I heard elsewhere just really has rocked my life and I'm still processing is the statement that the disciples belonged before they believed. That's, that's, ah, that's amazing. They belonged. They were actually brought into the tribe, if you will, and they were there before they knew what was going on. It wasn't until later in the journey they came to a place where they said, well, Jesus, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the most high. That was after a while. So they actually belonged. They were brought into relationship, into a process of doing life together. And it was in that that they learned who Jesus was. I, I've got a feeling that the Lord is going to not dumb down or, or stall or take away from the sending into all the world because it's so vital. But I feel like he wants to add an element of presence and power to how we do life at home. The people can actually be brought into a community setting, a family setting where we learn to do life together. And in the process, they're actually being discipled and mentored in the things of the Lord. I don't know if you realize this, but it's already happening in our community. One of the bizarre things that's happening is we will have uh, business uh, people who want to hire uh, 
hire em, em, employees for their work, and, and they will say something to this effect. They'll say, uh, we, we want to hire someone from, from Bethel because they changed the atmosphere in our business. Yeah. All right. Now, I, I'm not expecting uh, someone who doesn't walk with the Lord to know what it is they're wanting. They're wanting the presence of God. Yeah. We know that. All they know is there's a good vibe on that person. <laughs> All they know is they smile a lot and we need that in this business. You know, how, however they put it. But what's happening? By you being in their life and bringing this presence into their environment, you know what you're doing? You're actually discipling them on adopting the supreme value for the presence of God. They don't have the theology yet because you don't have to have the theology to start with. They, the disciples did, this is, this is almost scary. The disciples didn't have the theology and they still got people healed and delivered. They got, it's, it's like when my, my brother Bob once years ago on the streets of San Francisco was taking groups, uh, there were young people there that he had been training. He was sending them to different parts of the street ministry and uh, to, to, you know, you guys go over here, preach, you guys go hand off food. And he, he was just giving them assignments. What he didn't realize is that he grabbed somebody who was just walking by who was a law student and was just walking by, but Bob's six foot six, you tend to listen to him when he says, hey, you, come over here, go over there. So, so, so this, this, this law student gets drafted, gets put in this group that is sent over here to preach, and he just goes. He goes with him. The, um, this, is, this is a bizarre story. He goes with them, and God uses him. I know it doesn't fit our theology, but God uses him. People get healed. People get set free because Bob told them what to do. And uh, the end result was people got healed, saved, delivered. And it was so powerful, so did he. He came back and gave his life to Jesus. So he, he belonged. Uh, it just, it upsets the whole apple cart. I mean, the whole thing gets ruined on how you get people saved and to disciple them. This thing of, of belonging, what happened here is the Lord is into cities, communities, family. Our Father, not my Father. We have the mind of Christ, not I have the mind of Christ. There's something about this overlapping grace that we carry when we're together that means nothing can slip by. Because we have, a, we have grace, we have anointing, we have faith, we have people that are functioning in their gift. And together, we are incredibly strong. Wow. And the Lord is raising up a company of people that actually know how to reign in life. That everything in life, is anybody else tired of circumstances dictating how you think and how you feel and all that? That's, that's what he's dealing with here, is a wisdom. And it's supernatural. Wisdom, by the way, is prophetic in nature. I, I hope that you, I, I should, let me take a little detour just for a moment. Wisdom is prophetic in nature. You look at that wall over there, all you see is sheetrock, you see paint. Wisdom knows what holds the wall up. Wisdom sees the wood behind it, the steel beams, whatever is there. Wisdom sees beyond the obvious into internal structures that hold things in place. So when we're talking about divine wisdom, we're talking about the ability to perceive with God's eyes and be involved in divine reasoning to not only what exists, but what the solution and answer is for that particular challenge or dilemma. So when the Lord summons us into wisdom, he is actually summoning us into a lifestyle where life works. All right, that was a long introduction and I still have more. So just bear with me. So what happens here with the kings that come to Solomon for wisdom? That tells me that if the mind of God is accessible, all the leaders of the world have an inbuilt grace and gift to pursue it. You understand the king of a nation that travels a great distance to sit at Solomon's feet, they didn't do it because somebody commanded them to. They did it because they had an appetite. Where'd they get the appetite? The appetite came with a position. Yeah. <laughs> 
Think about the ramifications when somebody comes into position as CEO of a corporation. They run a major uh, part of industry, life, a government, a mayor, governor, president, whatever it might be, these, these people who lead uh, areas of, of entertainment and sports and these, these realms of influence, the, the, the doctors that, that, that run hospitals, and, and uh, it, it, they all have this thing in them that came with a position. It's called a grace that hungers for wisdom. And I'd like to suggest that the cry of the heart has been unanswered for a long time because the church has had this idea that it's us over here who are spiritual and it's them over there that are doing quote unquote secular work. Thankfully, in recent years, that line is being erased and we are becoming awakened to the fact they have a God-given hunger for something you have access to. All right. Let's see what else? <laughs> okay, I think that's probably enough to get going. All right, open your Bibles to the book of Exodus 31, and uh, let's see if we can. Nope, I still have some more, but just open anyway. Op- open anyway. Uh, so I'm trying to set the stage so that so that I don't know. So I can talk, I guess. I'm talking so that I can talk. Like, like Larry Randolph used to say, I'm going to keep talking till I say something. So that's, that's, that's what I'm working on here. The concept of new revelation being like the diamond put into the previous revelation, which, which would be the setting. What I'm going to do right now is I'm, it's going to look like I'm changing gears, but I'm actually not. I want to talk to you about being full of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we know what that means. We know that Jesus told his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And there was this baptism, immersion in the Spirit. There is this fullness of the Holy Spirit. You know, a, a bottle, a, a glass is not full, not really full until it overflows. So fullness of the Spirit is always measured in overflow. It's not measured in what's contained. We are not containers. We are vessels that he flows through. So fullness is measured in overflow. So when we look at the subject of the fullness of the Spirit in the New Testament, which would be the new revelation, would be the diamond, it is the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to bring release to captives. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon us so that a disease is destroyed, that people get healed, people get delivered. I just got a testimony this last week. I was just in Atlanta a week ago at our church, uh, church plant there, and a gal came up to me and she said, six years ago, you prayed for me. I had uh, bladder cancer, and Jesus completely healed her, and she's, uh, this particular kind of cancer is the kind that comes back frequently uh, just reoccurs and she has gone back for six years and there's just no not the slightest subtlest subtlest tumor so the spirit of the Lord comes upon us to destroy that threat against that individual's life to break off the torment that keeps people in fear and anxiety and all all the stuff and so the spirit of the Lord comes upon us for this so the fullness of the spirit is for power that's the diamond But I want you to see the setting. The setting is here in Exodus 31 verse, we'll read one through three. Actually, we're past that, five. Uh, Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. I absolutely love this passage, and this goes on. It has to do with the building of the tabernacle of Moses. But what you need to catch, this is the first time anyone was filled with the Spirit. It's the first time. 
So the, the point I'm trying to make is the initial revelation of the fullness of the Spirit is this. It's wisdom. It's understanding. It's the creative expression of work. The testimony of divine nature through artistic labor, work, things that everybody in this room in some way contributes to the well-being of your community. Every one of us are alive and assigned to do work, to do labor, to live for the well-being of people around us. Every leader that is worth anything makes life better for everyone they influence. It's the, it's the purpose of leadership. The purpose of leadership is not to draw to ourselves. The purpose of leadership is always to make life better for anyone who is under the influence of our leadership. So this original revelation of the fullness of the Spirit has to do with wisdom. I... I don't think this is a stretch. Do you remember when the Apostle Paul in Acts 19, he insisted on the privilege of doing work for his own ministry. And he had a tent making ministry. So here he is in his tent making ministry, walking in uh, uh, that responsible work as a laborer, and people would notice that his ministry time was so powerful, they would come to him and they would take headbands, sweatbands off his head that he used while building tents. They would take aprons off of his body, things that he would use while making tents. They would take work elements to the sick and the tormented and those people would get delivered. The point I'm trying to make is they weren't prayer claws that were prayed over. They were fabric material that was used while he was working. It's the merging of the wisdom creative element, the responsibility element with the power element. These two together caused even work clothes to be supernaturally powerful for casting out demons and bringing healing to people's bodies. I'm just telling you, the Lord has this intention on merging these two worlds. The first revelation of the fullness of the Spirit is wisdom, understanding, creative workmanship. The second revelation, the diamond put in that setting, is power. And then you have Paul working on tents and people getting healed from his clothing. I think the Lord wants to merge the two. I think he wants to create a company of people that know how to live in both worlds, know how to live in the business world, know how to live in the economic world, in the marketplace world, know how to live in the educational system, medical system, but still know how to live in power, to work in power. I, 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 I feel like, yeah. I mean, this is not... This is not new for us. We, we've been harping on this for a long time. I, I understand that. But I, at the same time, I feel like every time we declare this, there's like this fresh fire. There's this fresh anointing. It's like the Lord has taken mindsets that have existed in, in many of us as believers, those mindsets, and it's just it's like a big cruise ship. You just don't get that thing to pull a U-turn in a few minutes. You, you just got to, it takes a while to get that thing just turned around. That's what he's doing with our thinking. There's so many people that, that interpret the day that we live in as, as tragic and hellish and horrible, et cetera, et cetera, and feel powerless to do anything about it. And the opposite is true because the enemy works hard to keep us conscious of his success so that we lose sight of our assignment and call. He doesn't mind. In fact, he likes being chased by us. Mario Murillo told us years ago, he says, the devil will enter a bar of soap if you'll worship it. All he wants is attention. All right, now let, let me uh, open your Bibles to uh, Isaiah 60. And this is a portion uh, I've already uh, took a little bit of time to study with you in this series. But I, I, I need to do this again today. I just need to do it to be able to close this thing up. I'll feel better if we look at Isaiah 60. I've shared with you before, I had an, I've had two, what I consider, major encounters with the Lord in my life. 
many, many, many encounters, but two, two that changed everything. And one of them was, was very, very physical, very violent in a sense. Not violent in the sense he was going to kill me, but it sometimes felt like it was being electrocuted. And uh, I'll just let you wonder about that one. The first one actually came in a revelation. It, came, it touched mind and heart, which wisdom unites the spirit of a person with the intellect of a person. And he, he, spoke, he began to speak to me. It was on a Thursday in May of 1979. He began to speak to me out of Isaiah chapter 60. And it changed my life. Every single day of my life since that Thursday in May of 1979, every single day of my life since then has been different because of what happened in that moment. I want to show you a few things. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, almost out of context, read a few verses in 60 61 and 62, and then I want to talk to you and see if we can tie it together. You ready to go on a little journey? We're in a helicopter flying over the city. All right. Verse 1, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. When do we remember kings coming to anyone in the kingdom previous to this? It was Solomon and it was the issue of wisdom. I would like to suggest that Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 1, I think it's verse 30 or 31, Jesus Christ is, is our wisdom. The person of Jesus, maybe 2 Corinthians, is it 2 I, I fogged out here. It's in one of those two places. Just keep reading. You'll find it. <laughs> Jesus is our wisdom. I'd like to suggest to you that the light of God, that Jesus, who is our wisdom, rises upon us, and once again, kings come to our light. Kings come to the brightness of our eyes. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They gather together. They come to you. Your sons come from afar, your daughters come, uh, be nursed at your side. Jump to 61, Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, opening a prison to those who are bound. Jump to verse 4. They shall rebuild the old ruins. They will raise up former desolations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. 62. Verse 6. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. All right. I just read randomly a series of verses. Now let me walk you through them. Isaiah 60 gives this commission and call. Arise and shine. What does it mean? Because the light of God has come upon you, you have the capacity to shine. You and I do not reflect the light of God. We shine with the light of God. The way things work in the kingdom, when light touches you and you yield to it, you become light. I don't mean you are the light. Jesus Christ, of course, is the light of the world. But Jesus himself said, tag, you're it. Actually, he said it a little differently. He said, you're the light of the world. <laughs> Same thing. So whenever God touches us in a particular way, it changes our nature and our capacity to live. So I'm sitting here in total darkness. Jesus comes. I see that he is the light of the world. Now what happens? Not only do I reflect him, but he has taken up residence in me and I now shine. So he says, get up. Why? Because don't expect another light to come. I'm the light. Shine. And then he goes on and he says, deep darkness covers the world. But my light appears on you. My glory rises on you. Now this is vital. Because in the very next scene, when the people of God realize that what he has done is sufficient to change our capacity to shape the course of history. When we realize it was enough and it was sufficient, we get up, suddenly kings come to our light. 
and nations to the brightness of our rising. What's happening? The Solomon effect is taking place. I don't mean the Solomon effect in, in that people come to you and me because we know everything, we answer, we, we, it's not that. It's that people see <clears throat> such favor on your life. They see that things just work for you. They see that there's, there's a God element on you that has changed how you live and they're hoping to get some. They're hoping to stand under the shadow of your safety, of your protection. Jesus instructed us in this. He said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works, but glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's what Isaiah 62 said, all right? Let me walk you through it again, I'm sorry. Isaiah 60, get up and shine. You'll attract the kings of the earth. All right, 61, the baptism of power. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me to bring release to captives. The next scene, the broken people are now the builders of the city. So what was the target from the beginning? Get up and shine, use what you have. You're gonna shape history. They're gonna come to you for answers. The spirit of God's gonna come upon you. The people that you heal and get, uh, the, they get set free, the broken get restored. They are gonna be the builders of the city. What was the intention? Communities being restored. Redemptive communities restored to God's design and purpose. Then what happens is we take no rest for ourselves and we give him no rest until those communities of the redeemed are used by God to stir up the praise in the nations of the earth for the goodness of God. Take no rest for yourself. Give him no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. What does that mean? It means the community of the redeemed would live in such a way that everybody observing them just stands in awe and glorifies God. It's not a time for applauding you, applauding me. It's, it's I see that God has worked on your behalf and life works for you. And because of that, I'm going to give glory to the one who has inspired you and empowered you and changed your life. There's this cycle where the wisdom of God gets married to the power of God. And those two together create a ministry tension, tension in a positive sense, uh, over, an overlap that makes us qualified and capable to minister in any situation. It's overt and covert ministry is what it is. Overt is the bold preaching of the gospel. Covert is subtly being worked into the system. And whatever you're strongest at, reveals what you're in greatest need of. We have, we have many in our culture that are very good at boldly preaching, and I'm, I'm their biggest fans, because I, I love the bold preaching of the gospel. But what happens then, in that company of people, in that school of thought, we have to teach another part of this gospel of the kingdom. Be willing to get sprinkled into a system to, be, to bring transformation from the inside out. And for those who are married to the long-term 20, 30, 40 year concept of infiltrating a system and transforming a culture and society, amen to that, because I love that stuff. But I wanna introduce you to the God of power because you get to confront devils. You, you get to break off the stuff that's been tormenting people's lives. I, I don't think this is a random journey. I, I, I skipped over a lot of stuff. I'll let you read it on your own. But the issue of the light of God coming to you, qualifying you to be one who stands, is profound. And then having you as one who stands, becoming a light, the city on a hill, the people seek refuge in, that's profound. And then you add the New Testament element of power to that wisdom. Suddenly, the most broken people in the city become the builders. And we will only be successful in the restoration of cities of the earth in the degree we value the most broken among us. And so now we've got these who have found the Lord, have risen up with wisdom. People come to them to seek counsel. And now we've got the power element. We have the most broken among us become the builders. What happens? Now we start praying globally. We're saying, God, we're gonna take no rest for ourselves and we're not gonna give you any rest 
until you make the community of the redeemed a praise in the earth. I don't know if you've thought about this, but it is possible and actually an assignment that your life would release others to give God praise. That's not just, that's not just words to a song. It's not, a, it's not just a cute little chorus. It's not just an inspired thing you put on a card. This is a mandate from heaven to live in such a way that people are released into the glory because they are so delighted in what they see in your life. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father. I'm wondering, in this last day's revival, in this billion soul harvest that we've been summoned to, I'm wondering how many of them will actually be saved because they were drawn to the Spirit of God on another believer's life. They saw that they reign in life. They don't, they don't know they should long for the presence. All they know is your countenance makes a difference in their work. And you're, uh, without them knowing it, you're discipling them in values. There's this interesting verse I, I found recently. It's in, in the Passion Translates. It, the Passion Translation, he translates it so powerful. He's talking about this giving of a gift. And he says, when you, when, you, when you give this gift to this person, listen to the phrase, you awaken their conscience. <laughs> this is amazing. He, he, I'm sitting at the table, I'm at lunch, I'm, I'm eating at such and such a restaurant, and I decide, I'm just going to go overboard today. I want to really bless this waitress. So I, I'm going to give a gift that is not typical. It's going to, it's going to violate standards and expectations. What have I done? I have just initiated a process in somebody's life that awakens a conscience. <laughs> awakens a conscience. Awaken, what, what does that mean? Awakens people to divine values. Let your light shine before men in such a way they see your good works, but glorify your Father in heaven. I wonder how many people are going to find themselves standing, giving honor to God because of you, and find that they just stepped into faith for their own salvation. See, what I've been dealing with for these weeks is the intentional lifestyle that says, yes, I want to confront disease. Yes, I want to confront torment. Yes, I want to bring people into the kingdom. But I also want to be sprinkled into a city, into a community where everybody gets to belong before they believe and in that process, I'm in this one for the rest of my life. 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is, because I want to see a transformation from, with, from within, from the inside out. I feel like that's the two edges, if you, got, if you will, of the gospel, the, the go and the abide in a sense that attracts. And both elements are necessary for what God's about to release into the earth. So why don't you go ahead and stand. And let's, let's just pray, pray, pray. You know, I was, I was thinking this last week, uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, about uh, when Jesus told the dis uh, a few of the disciples are fishing, and he told them, cast your net on the other side. I've just always thought of that as a, just a very, very cool story. Uh, 
you know, God just showing his kindness once again. I, I, I never thought of it in this light. These guys that are fishing are fishermen. That's their business. He was giving them business advice. Now, how many know if you're the guy that throws the net on the other side and your net starts breaking and everyone else who has been at sea with you and all the other boats caught nothing, you may attract attention. You may have people that come to you that say, I want what you have. And then you just tell them, you just cast your net where I cast it. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord knows how to do life. He knows where the fish are. And if there's no fish there, when he tells you to cast there, he's going to create the fish. <laughs> so like the guy said, I crawled out on a limb. I cut off the wrong side. And God made the tree fall over. <laughs> However it works, I'm happy. But I want you to pray right now. I'm going to pray for you. And I want to pray for this wisdom thing as we wrap up this particular uh, part of our, uh, our series together. Father, um, I'm asking for grace to be released over this household, over this family of believers. Where, where we just think more consistently with how you think just with a refusal to ever be impressed with the devil. Even to the point of intimidation, never being intimidated. I pray for that grace. I ask as well, Lord, for that wisdom for life and that everybody in this room would get to mentor someone in where you've given each one authority. We want our city to be blessed. And we want them to be blessed because of you. We want them to be blessed because... You just told us where to cast the nets. You were the one who said the fish are over here. You were the one that said the breakthrough's here. And I pray for this grace to come upon this body right now in Jesus' wonderful name. I ask, Lord, that our lives would ignite in the hearts of people a passion for God. That's our bottom line.